Welcome to the Interlocked Bible Study. We're on Lesson 48, the third part and final section of the lesson, <clears throat> where we've been covering the book of Revelation, and specifically the opening of the seven scrolls. As you see in the chart before you, we've we've identified that the book of Revelation is it has these events that take place in heaven, and and then we see the the outcoming, the outcome, the practical, visible uh, outcome <clears throat> and impact on Earth. So, like in the chart in front of you, you see a, a large letter A and then a small letter A, etc. So when you see uh, one event taking place in the heaven, heavenly realm, you see it actually playing out on earth. So uh, we've been covering this aspect of the seven years of tribulation, and we covered uh, up to six seals that were opened by the Lord Jesus Christ. This seal is a document um to inherit the kingdom of God and for the inheritance to come to fulfillment and to fruition, uh, these seals had to be broken. And each, as each of the seals were broken, uh, for the document to be taken, uh, to be read and taken possession of, um, each of these seals brought about a judgment. And we compared last recording to Matthew chapter 24, where Jesus is explaining firsthand to his disciples uh, of future events. So he gives some of the, the general terms from, the, uh, from his time, and then John the apostle in the book of Revelation uh, fleshes it out with a few more details, but it's referring to the same events, um, the false Christ coming, the white horse, uh, that war and famine is coming, uh, or the red and black horse, that death it follows, uh, that the pale horse, uh, death and Hades, swallow up those who are dead. There's martyrdom, there's there's miraculous signs that take place. So um, we are going to co cover today the opening of the seventh and final seal. Um, but right before the Lord Jesus opens that seal, he in turn seals uh, 144,000 uh, people, specifically men and specifically Jews, upon the opening uh, of this, before the opening of the seal. So let's look at uh, a little bit of detail about who are these 144,000 and what, what's the story around that? So in Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 to 3, describes it like this. Then I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds, so they did not blow on the earth or the sea or even on any tree. And I saw another angel coming up from the east carrying the seal of the living God, and he shouted to the four, those four angels who have been get, given power to harm the land and the sea, wait, wait, don't harm the land or the sea or the trees until we have placed the seal of God on the foreheads of his servants. So the Bible uses this very high-level symbolism, symbolic language to describe things that are happening on the earth. So these four angels are stationed around the globe, uh, also called the four corners of the earth, and they're holding back the four winds, which have the ability to harm the land and the sea. So there's a good probability that this symbolizes the judgments that are to come uh, because we talked about we heard about harm uh, we we see that the angels are then told to uh, hold back and so the likelihood of of this wind symbolizing the the disaster that is to come upon earth is is highly likely so this a fifth angel he 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 kicks into high gear and and he takes this seal of God, whatever that is. We don't know exactly what this seal of God looks like, uh, uh, but he needs to seal God's faithful servants before the the further judgments arrive. Uh, this this mark will be on their foreheads. 
Okay, so we don't know what what does this look like. Uh, like, is this a visible tattoo? Uh, the Bible does not say. Um, however, seals typically mean in scripture or or in that time frame, it's a sign of ownership. And so, in this case, God's placing His mark of ownership on these specific individuals, these believers in the Lord Jesus Christ during the tribulation time. Uh, he's sealing as often indicates protection too. Uh, so God will protect the, that which he owns. Uh, just like you and I, uh, we buy insurance so we can protect our car, or protect our home for the potential things that happen. So you see this type of uh, contractual seal taking place in order to protect. It can also symbolize power, where God has power over uh, what and who is sealed. Uh, he He's in ultimate control. If you're the owner, you get to decide how you use your car, how you use your home, in what ways. It's yours to do whatever you wish to. And so God places his seal on 144,000 individuals. And it, it also indicates a promise in that God keeps his promise to those who are sealed. Now you see this in uh, the er, the church of Jesus Christ in the book of Ephesians, where in chapter one, it specifically says that we're bought with a price where we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit in our lives. So there's a high high probability that in a similar way to the, uh, the people of the church age and being sealed by God with his spirit, his spirit being placed in, in mankind, that in a similar way you have this type of sealing by the Holy Spirit of these individuals. But that uh, is not specifically stated in the text here. So uh, who and how many people are, are are being sealed here? Well, we, we, we see this in chapter 7, verse 4. And I heard how many were marked with the seal of God. 144,000 were sealed from all the tribes of Israel. So specifically, specifically speaking of the ethnic group called Israel, the Jewish people, and specifically, uh, 12,000 from each of these tribes. So the tribes mentioned by John, they're not the typical ones we find in the, in the, in uh, when 12 tribes are listed. Uh, for example, on this list that you see in the chart before you, uh, the tribe of Dan isn't on the list. And we're not really sure why. Um, uh, because in the, in the distribution of the promised land, and also during the distribution of land in the coming kingdom, uh, in Ezekiel chapter 48, verse 1, you see that Dan does have a share in the allotment of land. Uh, so we don't know why Dan's not mentioned in this specific specific uh, instance. Levi, however, who, who, he is listed here, which is typically not listed among the, the land owners because Levites ministered to God while living among the other tribes. They weren't land large property owners. And yet they're on this list as, as far as individuals that are selected from this, this tribe within a, uh, an ethnic group. And then the tribe of Ephraim is also not on the list. But we see the tribe of Joseph, for example. Uh, so the Bible doesn't, again, doesn't tell us why Joseph's mentioned, because Joseph had two sons, uh, one in, whose name is Ephraim and the other one Manasseh, and they are the ones who are typically mentioned within the 12 tribes of Israel who, whose uh, land is allotted to them. So uh, the specific number However, the list of tribes is a total of 144,000, and they are, are Jewish people uh, that come to faith in God during the tribulation period, not before. It's very clear that it's not prior to because uh, otherwise they would be part of the church, the body of Christ, and they would be uh, removed from the scene from earth in a rapture as part of the church and the church program. And But these guys are part of the Israel program. And remember, the, the seven-year tribulation period 
is the prelude to this 1,000 year uh, reign of Jesus Christ on earth and fulfillment of all the, the, the covenants made to Abraham and his descendants. So it's an, it's a pr- Israeli pro- program. It's God's program with his people and the fulfillment of that. So these 144,000 Jews are a part of that, uh, specifically. Um, and so he's, he's going to seal them, set his special, uh, uh, seal in order to set them aside to do his work. Okay. So these guys have a work, a, uh, a mission. <clears throat> could, could we then surmise that we could possibly call these guys missionaries? Okay. Because that's essentially what missionaries are, is they are sent ones, ones who are sent by God. And in, in the case of here during the church age, it's by local churches from around the world. They're sent out to a mission. And that mission is to fulfill the great commandment, uh, the great commission of making disciples of all the nations. Okay. Uh, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, the Holy Spirit, uh, and then teaching each of these dis- new disciples uh, how to become Christ-like or to become uh, uh, totally, fully devoted disciples and followers of Jesus Christ. So you see some similarities here that as as the church is removed from earth, this God and his grace, because this is what it is, it's God's grace and mercy to the people of earth in the, during this time of judgment and tribulation. He extends once more, more and more and more possibility of redemption and of reconciliation with their creator. Uh, rec- be to be re- saved from the power of sin and Satan and and death in their lives, and and to be granted eternal life in Christ Jesus, who who by this time has you know has has already paid the death debt uh, 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 payment um, of our sin, and they they the Jewish people and the nations of the earth are extended this opportunity once again to to hear the gospel message as preached from the mouth of Jews, okay, not not from the mouths of Gentiles, but specifically from from a Jewish perspective of a kingdom message, um, probably similar to that which Jesus himself preached and his followers and John the baptizer of, hey, um, repent for the kingdom of heaven as at hand. So we've got this kingdom of heaven that's going to come to earth and very, very soon at this point. And they go out and they preach the gospel, but they also have the gospel of the New Testament, where now we have the risen Lord Jesus too. Uh, so uh, their their gospel, the, the kingdom is enriched by the, the message that Jesus lived, he died, he rose again from the dead. He has also established his ter- church, taken this church now. Uh, the the people of this time frame will have a much greater and clearer understanding uh, as as they hear this gospel from the these Jewish missionaries. Um, let's go into a little bit more detail about them from Revelation chapter fourteen, verses one to four. Then I saw the Lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of mighty ocean waves or the rolling of a loud thunder. It was like the sound of many harpists playing together. This great choir sang a wonderful new song in front of the throne of God. And before the throne, or the, before the four living uh, beings and the 24 elders, and that's the scene from the throne room of God as described by John, no one could learn this song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. They have kept themselves as pure virgins, following the lamb wherever he goes, they have been purchased from among the people on the earth as a special offering to God and to the Lamb. They have 
told no lies, they are without blame or blameless. Okay, so these guys, these guys are standing triumphant uh, before the throne of God uh, in this scene that that John John is is granted um, a, a vision to to see, and and it's clear here by the text that they are men. And here's another translation that that uh, actually spells it out. Uh, this is from the New King James version. It's from Revelation chapter 14, the first part of verse 4. It says, these are the ones who were not defiled with women. Okay, so on one hand, it says virgins. This one specifically says, these are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Okay, so... Uh, clearly indicating that these specific missionaries, now this doesn't <clears throat> mean that uh, the gospel is exclusive to men, not, not by any means. Uh, God in his sovereignty, he chose to for men to, to take responsibility of this specific project and, and cause. Um, and, and obviously women are going to be saved through this time as they hear the gospel as well, and they're more than everyone's free to preach the gospel, but these are just the specific ones that are sealed for a specific purpose for a specific time. And God chose that in his sovereignty. So it's kind of, it could be similar to where we see Jesus himself uh, choosing 12 disciples. Um, uh, and these were 12 apostles. They were all Jewish men. Uh, that were sealed by the Holy Spirit to, to initiate the the starting of the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ on earth. Uh, Jesus specifically mentions to Peter upon this rock, I, I'm going to build my church. Basically, all the activities of the apostles would 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 set into motion this program of, of raising up uh, disciples from all over the nations around the world from every tongue, tribe, and nation. And so in a similar way, it's a good possibility that these 144,000 Jewish men are spirit-sealed Jewish uh, believers who also have the same responsibility. We're going to uh, build uh, a church, if you will, an ecclesia of sorts, but it's going to be a short-term one because these guys aren't going to live very long. I'm not talking about the missionaries, but the but the ones who are in the tribulation period are going to be facing massive contradiction and and persecution uh, for their faith. And so the longevity, the lifespan of a Christian, the Christ follower at this time, is not likely very long. You can't be planning for retirement in this particular period. Um, so uh, it, John, John, he, he sees this scene. He hears what's going on, and and behind behind them, like in the the the, the aftermath of these guys and their ministry. There's this massive multitude of people who are praising God, and they come from a, out of the tribulation period. So the connection we want to make here is that God calls these men, and then out, out from them come uh, this vast group of people from every tongue, tribe, and nation that are, are now Christ's followers. They're redeemed people. Let's look at the uh, verses from Revelation chapter 7, verses 9, and then 13 to 14. After I saw this, after this, you know, this is after the 144,000 scene, then I saw a vast crowd, too great to count. Uh, I like the sound of that. It reminds me of Abraham and God taking him out and saying, look at all the stars in the sky. Look at the sand on the seashore. That's how, that's how many your descendants are going to be. And so it's, it's wonderful news. Uh, how many the Lord Jesus Christ is going to redeem from the tribulation period in spite of not having taken advantage of the gospel prior to uh, the removal of the church from the scene. So you've got this huge, vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language. All right, so if there is a tribe, an ethnic group on earth today, that remained in some level of isolation from the gospel, uh, the gospel will be preached during this time and, and they will be redeemed from this, this, this specific seven-year period. 
Um, so if the church doesn't fulfill her task during during the church time prior to the rapture, uh, certainly Jesus will accomplish the purpose of redeeming at least one person, at least one person from every tongue, tribe, and nation uh, 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 of, the, of the most isolated tribe on earth. Uh, so uh, that's why we say the return of Jesus Christ is actually imminent. We don't know um, if if reaching the final tribe with the gospel actually triggers the return of Christ or not. We actually don't know because we have this promise during the seven year period that every tongue, tribe, and nation will be represented as a result of the ministry of the hundred forty four thousand. So that so they're standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. Then one of the 24 elders asked me, uh, so who, who are these who are clothed in white? Where did they come from? <laughs> and I said to him, sir, uh, you're the one who knows. And he said to me, these are the ones who died in the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb and made them white. So they're specifically people who died. They died for their faith. They died during this seven-year period. We're, we're talking about massive, massive amount of people uh, all throughout the world dying. Some are being killed. Some are dying from these, these uh, judgment uh, seals that are being opened and trumpets and bowls that are being poured out, the judgments. But a lot of these specifically are, are dying for their faith. So this great number of people, <clears throat> uh, some of them uh, um, are are uh, are believers. Like they're 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 they'll be they'll become believers and they'll die during the tribulation, perhaps while the seals are being opened. And and this is a message of hope for you, for all all mankind. And I think it should leave us during the in the church age as a peace of mind. So uh, it's not an excuse, but it's a peace of mind if you have a friend or a family <clears throat> that absolutely refuses to accept the Lord Jesus as our Savior today. And, and the Lord comes back and raptures a church. We say it's too late, right? That's that's our tendency. Oh, it's too late. You you missed you missed the train, you missed the bus. A thing, it, there's no hope now. Well, the actually, we are seeing a, a hope here. D during the tribulation period, your friend, your family member, who maybe is a, 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 a they claim that they're a believer, they really didn't understand the gospel, they really didn't uh, um, uh, accept the Lord as their savior. But later on, they're like, oh man, I blew it, I missed the train. Well, it's not too late. They can accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. <clears throat> now, there is this passage that suggests that there will be this strong delusion to believe a lie. So, um, I wouldn't, uh, if I were you and I'm not a believer and you're, I'm listening to this today, I wouldn't take my chances. You may, you may miss the boat and you may miss the, the, uh, the the train in the during the tribulation period because of the convincing manner of the words of the antichrist and the society of that day that you just don't believe so i wouldn't i wouldn't um i wouldn't mess around with this stuff i would take care today of my spiritual condition before before an almighty god but it this is a time of mercy as well and i think that should be an encouragement to you and i so why did god allow john to see 144000 and then followed by this <clears throat> great multitude. So the Bible doesn't really say, but um, but perhaps this great number of people that come to faith because of the 144,000 uh, Jews, um, the the gospel shared with them. They they become believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and 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 uh, they're 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 invited to share life together in in the heavenly realm. Um, it's a sign of grace and mercy and truth. Uh, um, but the Bible tells us that many of these new believers will be will be killed. Uh, it can happen by war, famine, persecution. But whatever the case is, they'll be granted rest and peace, safety with the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation. 
chapter 7, verse 10 says, and they were shouting with a great roar. Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And so right after that scene, it closes down, and then all of a sudden we we get ushered into the final uh, opening <clears throat> of the seal. Um, the seventh seal is open, broken, and we see a very interesting <clears throat> language as to what happens upon the opening. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1 says, When the Lamb, so this is the Lord Jesus himself again, he's opening these seals. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal on the scroll, there was silence throughout heaven for about half an hour. So 30 minutes of silence in heaven. This is unusual because heaven, anytime we see a scene, a heavenly scene, um, in different parts of scripture, like you're talking from Genesis on to Revelation, heaven is not a, this quiet place. It's not this, um, this, these little cherubs with wings, uh, playing harps, and there's this people, peaceful people floating around, and, and it's real quiet, and it's not we don't see that in, in 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 any aspect of heaven it's actually a really noisy place especially in the before the throne of god there's constant worship and shouting and you hear things like and the angel spoke with the voice of a trumpet like whoa that, that must have been loud like the blast of a trumpet holy you know um we're, we're not heaven is not this quiet peaceful place we yeah, just a side comment here. We we tend to think and 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 granted there's there's times when we need quiet. We need time of meditation and we need to get away and get quiet with the Lord. Uh, Jesus himself did that when he was on earth. He 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 escaped to a quiet place, up to a mountain sometimes in a, a desolate place and he had quiet time with his father. Okay, so there's an appropriate place for that. Um but life is chaotic, and, and we often get this sense that uh, a church meeting has to be this real, real austere type environment. And I'm not saying it's also supposed to be just people jumping up and down and, and, and rowdy uh, with a mosh pit in, in the front. And I, we're not talking about that either, but you see that it's definitely noisy. And so sometimes culturally, uh, you've got some individuals that will, will be attracted to a, a, this quiet, solitude meeting and others that are attracted to loud. Um, so you have these different cultures, but they're just that, they're culture. Whereas here in, in heaven, you're seeing lots of noise taking place and praise and loud speaking and praise and conversations. And, and so when, when the Bible says that the seventh seal is opened and there is silence in heaven, for the space of half an hour. That's a big deal. It's a big deal when everyone, the, the whole heavenly realm, the entire spiritual realm that is, is the scene in the heavenlies goes quiet. Something's about to blow. Something's about to happen. And it could be on one side, this sense of awe because of Jesus, who's, who's now finally getting his inheritance. Finally, you know, I mean, we're talking about uh, at least 6,000, close to 7,000 years of history that we have recorded in scripture. And it's like, finally, Jesus is taking kingship over all of the heavens and earth, uh, the earth that's that's being um, really heavily influenced by the angelic realm, this, this demonic, uh, the satanic uh, uh, contrarian roles that are being played out here on earth. He's finally taking possession. It could be in all of that, that they're quiet, or it's just this shock. They're just they're just blown away by what's going to come, what's what's happening next. Why? Because this the seventh seal is open, and out from the seven seventh seal, it unleashes these seven trumpets of judgment, and and this seventh 
trumpet that's blown unleashes seven bowls of wrath. Let's look into some of these details. In, in Revelation chapter 8, verses 2 to 4, it says, I saw seven angels who stand before God, and they were given seven trumpets. Then another angel with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar. And a great amount of incense, uh, it says, a great amount of incense was given him to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne. The smoke of, of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's holy people ascended to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. This is an amazing scene here because it's much like the, the picture from the Old Testament in, in the tabernacle or in the, the temple worship uh, on earth, uh, organized and, and, and led by Jewish uh, uh, priests. They, they had this golden altar of incense that was a symbol of the people's prayers. Uh, so during the morning and evening sacrifices, the priests offered incense as the people gathered to pray in the courtyard outside. And, and again, it's noisy. People are praying out loud. This is not this typical, I don't know, I could use Baptist as an example. There's other, other uh, denominations that do similar, but real quiet prayers and real organized prayer where uh, only after one person is done can another person actually utter some sort of noise and uh, don't dare pray on top of each other. But in, in this Jewish context, you had people praying out loud all over on top of each other and, and, and lifting up uh, intercessory prayers before God. Um, and this was happening in the courtyard outside. Prayer is, a, is this picture of sweet-smelling incense going up like perfume to Yahweh. You know, have you ever had that experience? Your your spouse puts on that that special uh, a perfume, and uh, right after shower, and it's just like, ah, wow, you smell clean, wow, you know, and. and and there's these these uh, chemical reactions and and memories and thoughts and feelings that go through. Well, so Yahweh, Yahweh, when His people pray, He He's filled with memory. He's filled with pleasure. He's filled with joy. He's He He's uh, He His His ear is in tune, and He's ready for action. And so in John, John sees the prayers of the people uh, mixed in with incense, and it goes up before the throne of God. So what are these people praying about? Well, possibly, like from Matthew chapter 9, 6, verse 9 to 10, you've got this uh, Jesus who shares with the Jews, Jewish followers, uh, pray like this, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy, or hallowed be thy name, and it says in the King James Version. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So maybe they're just calling out to God. May your kingdom come soon. May, may your will be done on earth, just right now on earth, just like it is in heaven, just like the throne, throne room is, is totally under your control. May earth also be into your 100% control under your leadership where Jesus himself is leading here on earth. Wow. So maybe those prayers like that, that, that are, uh, that waft up these wonderful, uh, incense to the heavenly father who then, who then it, it, it uh, it resonates with him and he responds with action. Or it could be another prayer, a prayer of vengeance, for example, like from Revelations chapter six verses 9 to 10, where it says, The Lamb broke the seventh, the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred and the word of for the word of God and for being faithful to their testimony. So these guys are just doing their job by being faithful followers of Jesus. And then it says, they shouted, they were killed. And so they shouted to the Lord and said, Oh, sovereign Lord, holy one, true. So this is praying, right? Uh, how long before you judge the people who belong to this earth and avenge our blood for what they have done to us? You know, the Bible says it's not that revenge won't be provided. It just specifies that vengeance is of the Lord. So you and I are not to carry out vengeance by our own hand, but allow for God uh, to tr trust God 
pray to God for vengeance on your behalf or the behalf of your loved ones that you've lost. You want justice. God wants justice. Let him deal uh, his justice in the way that he seems uh he deems best don't carry out vengeance yourself vengeance is mine saith the lord so that's what what we're learning doesn't mean that you and i cannot pray for vengeance um i had uh, a, a cousin of mine uh, who's a missionary in the country of paraguay and he was brutally murdered and um the, the the temptations of vengeance is strong and humanly speaking it's like man i just i just want to wring the necks to put it lightly uh, of those who dealt with my cousin in such a brutal fashion and cruel way uh and so the temptation for vengeance is high but w- when you commit your way to the lord you see that he brings about things justly in his time And I've received reports back since from uh, the country of Paraguay that these these murders of my cousin are all dead. They're all dead. They themselves have been killed and murdered or have died. uh, And and, and, and you see that the vengeance is, is in the hands of God. You see that that uh, perhaps these were the types of prayers that were lifted up to Yahweh and before his throne. And, and that, that these are the things that he's, he's, uh, that, that activates him. And so right after these prayers are offered, something happens. God, God is kicks into high gear into action. Uh, says the, then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar and threw it upon the earth and thunder crashed, lightning flashed. And there was a terrible earthquake. Then the seven angels with the seven trumpets prepared to blow their mighty blast. So they line up and, and they're ready for action now to pour and unleash some uh, horrible, horrible uh, ac- uh, actions on earth. Um, these, these consequences of the prayers of the saints. But it, immediately there's thunder, lightning, and earthquake, and, and there's repercussions to the prayers of the saints. So you see, believers pray and God judges. Do you see the pattern here? Believers pray and God judges. He acts. He acts upon the prayers of the saints. Uh, Don't don't think for a moment that God doesn't hear you. You may not see him acting in the way that you expect him to, but when you as a child of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords come before his throne in, in intercessory prayer, you approach him as a son or daughter approaches a father. And, and in the spiritual realm, he hears you. Your, your prayers are like incense to him. They're sweet smelling. They're, they're, they're like, uh, you know, that crude example I gave of, of a spouse that comes and they're recently showered and they, they put on perfume and they just smell good. It's like, man, I just want to give you a hug, you know, uh, and so you've got this this desirable God desires to hear your prayers and mine, and he his 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 ears are attuned to his children. He's not deaf, and and he kicks into gear into action. The way he kicks into action may not fulfill your expectation because of your limited understanding of Yahweh and how he acts and what his priorities are. But the fact that you spoke to him is absolutely key. Don't minimize the impact of your prayers. Don't minimize it. Your prayers have a strong effect on the memory and emotions of God and his level of engagement upon the earth. Um, and, and, and be careful of how you pray too. If you pray judgment on a specific individual, you know, that, that actually could happen. Um, so be careful how you pray because your prayers are indeed uh, heard by the Almighty God. However, uh, this is just an aside, and this is what I do a lot, is I pray according to the will of God. Dear Lord, may may your will be done, not my will, but your will be done, uh, so that my prayer isn't the center of of, uh, the action, but that God's will is the center, and that I'm praying according to his his purposes and to his mission. So in the next lesson, 
This is lesson 49. We're going to go through uh, the, the details of this, the, the seven seals having been opened, seventh seal open, and now the seven uh, uh, trumpet judgments are going to be unleashed upon earth. We're going to go through six of these trumpets, and then in another uh, lesson, go through the seventh, which opens up a whole nother can of worms, so to speak, uh, of judgments. So in the final, this final section, I want to ask the question. What, what is the war of Gog and Magog? When, when during, and during the time, uh, of what, what exactly is the time frame and when it, it's going to happen? Well, that's a tough question to ask and tough question to answer. So in the Bible, there's a, there's this one, uh, end time event and it's hard to place on the biblical timeline. It really is hard because God doesn't make it overly and abundantly clear. There's indications. There's uh, where you interpret scripture and light of scripture, and you can kind of give some ideas. But we don't have, we can't put our finger exactly on when this battle, this war of Gog and Magog takes place. So the prophet Ezekiel prophesied about this great war. Uh, so Gog is the, a leader, he's an individual, he's a human man, and then Magog is the nation, and, uh, and, and he's going to lead an alliance of nations that will gang up on Israel uh, while it's at peace. And so this nation will form uh, this alliance, this is found in Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 1 to 6. Uh, and we'll be located in what's now in the area of the Middle East, okay? Um, you've got North Africa included in there. You've got Russia uh, included. You've got Turkey. So it covers a vast amount of area. Um, and But we're going to notice, in, in, and we're going to look at this in a later lesson, but that there's another battle called the same thing, the, ba the Battle of Gog and Magog. And so it's not to be confused with this one. There's two two separate ones going on here. Let's look at Ezekiel real quickly. Ezekiel 38, verse 3, and then 8 to 11. Give him this message from the Lord, sovereign Lord. Gog, I am your enemy. Verse 8. Uh, a long time from now, you will be called into action. In the distant future, you will swoop down on on the land of Israel, which will be enjoying peace. After recovering from war and after its people have returned from many lands to the mountains of Israel, you and all your allies, a vast, awesome army, will roll down on them like a storm and cover the land like a cloud. This is what the sovereign Lord says at the time, at that time, evil thoughts will come to your mind and you will, will devise a wicked scheme. You, you're going you're gonna to say this, Israel is an unprotected land filled with unwalled villages. Uh, I will march against her and destroy these people who live in such confidence. So, so at this time, God's going to supernaturally rescue Israel. Okay, Ezekiel 38 verses 18 to 23, and then we'll read 39 verse 4 and 21 and 22. But this is what the sovereign Lord says, when Gog invades the land of Israel, my fury will boil over. In my jealousy and blazing anger, I promise a sh mighty shaking shaking in the land of Israel on that day. So we're talking about earthquakes here. All living things, the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the animals in the field, uh, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and all the people of the earth will quake in terror at my presence. Mountains will be thrown down, cliffs will crumble, walls will fall to the earth. I will summon the sword against you on all the hills of Israel. Uh, says the Lord, Sovereign Lord, your men will turn their swords against each other. I will punish you and your armies with disease and bloodshed. I will send torrential rain, hailstones, fire, and burning sulfur. In this way, I will show my greatness and holiness. I will make myself known to all the nations of the world. Then they will know that I and the Lord. Okay, so this is this is the scene that takes place. So you, uh, let me continue on how uh, from to verse 
chapter 39, verse 4, and then uh, verses 21 and 22, and then I'll comment. You and your army and your allies will all die on the mountains. I will feed you to the vultures and wild animals. Verse 21, in this way, I'll demonstrate my glory to the nations. Everyone will see the punishment I have inflicted on them and the power of my fist when I strike. And from that time on, the people of Israel will know that I am the Lord your God. Okay, so Ezekiel is saying that the Jews will gather, uh, and this is in later verses, uh, in the chapter of the Jews, is, they're going to gather all the weapons of, of the war and burn them for fuel. There will be so much that it will last for seven years. That's in Ezekiel 39, verse 9. Massive amount of war, war, war tools weapons. God will call on the birds and the wild animals and, and beasts to feast on the bodies of the dead or enemies. This is for chapter 39, verses 17 to 20. Uh, it's it's going to take several months for the Jews to bury the dead enemies. That's in verse 12 of Ezekiel 39. So the Bible doesn't state exactly when this war is going to occur, but if you if you look at some of the details uh, like seven years of of cleaning up, for example, then the likelihood that that those seven years go way into the 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 kingdom of God, the thousand year reign of Christ, is unlikely. Um, but uh, it could happen. Some scholars believe that it, that this war happens near the beginning of the tribulation in that time frame. Maybe even before the tribulation, but in this tribulation, early on in the tribulation period. Uh, where you've got uh, peace that's given to Israel, and then suddenly peace is stripped away. Uh, so it could happen in that time frame of you know this horseman that comes out. He he comes and brings peace, and then and then war erupts. Uh, here erupts. We don't know if that's if it's specifically that. Um, but if this is correct, if 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 it does happen early on, then the deaths of the of the political and military leaders who attacked Israel make room for this Antichrist to come in for global power um, and, and to take control. Um, again, we do not know the exact time. If it's outside the seven year period, inside or toward the end, it's it's an unknown factor. Uh, but later on, when we, we get to Revelation chapter 20, we're going to see that there's a second war with the same name, Gog and Magog. Uh, but but we'll look in that in detail a little bit later. And so just to remem rem remember that God, God is always in control. Yahweh it remains sovereign on the throne throughout the whole thing. He grants Satan and his followers and evil mankind, mankind in general, he gives them free will to exercise their uh, their their ideology, their thinking of building a man-made kingdom. Uh, but but ultimately, God is in control, and He's very involved in world worldwide affairs. God's not this God that just kind of winds up the clock and then releases it, and it's just whatever. Man's got to figure it out on his own. No, He is ultimately in charge, in control, and He will bring about His purposes. So. Let's not have this fatalistic attitude that our actions and prayers just simply don't have any effect on God. No, in, it has a direct line of effect. Our prayers enter into the throne room of God. Our prayers are desirable to God, and he it takes action as a result. So if there's a lot of noise in heaven, there's a lot going on. I dare say it's okay for you and I to make noise through our prayer. Um, uh, when you have this urgent need, or as a as a church fellowship, you've got someone hurting and suffering, get that prayer line going. Instead of just two or three people um, making a little bit of noise in heaven, uh, get a thousand people, mobilize a thousand, mobilize ten thousand people to prayer, and 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 make noise before the th throne room of God, and this is uh, goes up as an offering to God, and He takes action, He He commits to action as a result, and He will bring about His purposes and answer our prayer. So let's not lose hope. God is going to, uh, in this time frame, uh, completely um, uh, 
remove evil from earth and quarantine evil so that um, his kingdom will flourish without the influence of the wicked. And just as God had uh, declared holy war on Canaan and and used Israel as an instrument to bring about a purging of that land and, and to bring and to set forth uh, the success of his, his earthly kingdom through the people of Israel. In a similar way, you see that the, uh, that earth is going to go through this, this uh, declaration of holy war against the evil upon earth uh, in preparation for the coming of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. So we're going to close out there today in this recording. And then we'll begin uh, in our next recording uh, going through the trumpets. God bless you.